Hello folks, I'm Dean with Dean's Woodworking. Welcome to the shop. Y'all come on in and make yourself comfortable. Today we're going to do a little catch up. I'm going to do a little bit of turning and we're going to answer a few questions and we're just going to catch up for a few weeks of uh, no videos and no communication, okay? First of all, let me explain why you haven't seen any new videos in the uh, last little bit. I've had a couple of uh, health issues that kind of kept me out of the shop and fortunately we got those straightened out and everything's back to normal. Well, as normal as things can be anyway, let's put it that way. I'm feeling much better and I'm back out in the shop. Now this is the first time in several weeks that I've been able to get in the shop and do anything. So one of the things that we're going to do today, we're going to take this old gnarly piece of limb and we're going to do some practice cuts. It's one of those things anytime I haven't turned anything for a while, I want to do some cuts to make sure that, that my tools are doing what I think they should be and, and this and that piece of metal is connecting in a way that's uh, predictable, okay? So in the meantime, I want to answer a few questions. I got a ton of questions since the last video and, and a few even before the last video of what speed should I be turning at? Folks, the, the best analogy I can put to that is how fast should you be driving your car? Well, it kind of depends if you're in town on a farm to market road or out there on the racetrack, right? And exactly the same thing with the speed of your lathe. If you've got a big heavy lathe like this one way, you can probably get away with turning faster than maybe you should. At the same time, if you've got a small lightweight lathe and you try to turn at the same speed as you can turn on something like this, it's, you're not going to be able to catch that thing. It's going to be walking all over your shop. That's dangerous for you, it's dangerous for the machine, and something's bound to go wrong. There's formulas that I've heard. Uh, I don't know how accurate they are. I'm not here to tell you that this is the speed you should turn or you shouldn't turn, but one thing I will tell you. If you're uncomfortable with the speed you're at, slow it down. If you're watching this, chances are you're not a professional turner. You're a hobbyist. That means you're out there to have fun. So let's keep it safe, slow it down, and anytime you ask somebody, what speed should I turn? If they give you an answer, you probably shouldn't be uh, listening to that because numbers are not that important. By that, you know most of the professional lathes, the bigger lathes, don't even have digital readouts on them. For years there wasn't such a thing. That's a fairly recent addition to a wood lathe. We got to use this folks. Keep it safe. Another thing is that I've been getting a ton of questions on, I want to know exactly what the dimensions are when it's a limb project. Well when it's a limb project, the size of the limb determines the maximum size it can be. From that, you just turn it down to what you're comfortable with. The other thing is grind angles. So what's the angle on your skew? What's the angle on your bowl gouge? What's the angle on your spindle gouge? What's the best angle? Guys, this can be argued back and forth from now to doomsday. And I don't know that you're ever going to get the perfect answer because I don't think there really is a perfect answer. My suggestion to everybody is do what I did. I was asking the same questions in the beginning because I just didn't know. I settled on an angle and worked with it for a while and it seemed to work well so I used that one and then later somebody said something about a 40-40 grind so I grabbed another tool and I ground it to 40-40 and okay, well I can see the difference there. But don't stress so much on the grind angle because really it's more about you and practicing turning and getting used to using that tool 
and getting good at it than it is the angle of the grind. It's kind of like all the fishermen out there are looking for that one lure that if they put it in their tackle box, the fish will just jump in the boat. Well, that lure doesn't exist and neither does the perfect grind angle, okay? One other question I get a lot. I sometimes feel bad about even trying to answer this one is how much do you charge for that? Again, it's kind of like how fast do you drive your car? It depends on the area you're at. If, if you're out in a fairly remote area with a low population and, and the uh, median income is fairly low, you may not be able to get what I get. At the same time, if you're in a very high-end area, you may be able to get four times what I get. So is it really fair to tell you that for, well, let's just take this little piece right here. I think I get $30 for these. I see them on Etsy, and I know people have sold them for upwards of $50, $60, $75. If I put $50 on this in my area, I would bring them all home. So again, you just have to, to look around your area, go to some shows, see what other people in your area are charging, and what does their work look like? Is their work better than yours? If it is, you may not be able to charge as much as they charge. Is your work better than theirs? Well, if it is, maybe you can charge more than they're charging. The one thing in pricing I will tell you, when you start pricing your work out, you don't want to price it out so cheap that you're selling out of everything before you leave the show. And you don't want to price it out so high that you only sell a few items. If you find that sweet spot where people are buying, you're selling, they're happy, you're happy because you're making money, that's the price you should charge, okay? I hope that helps, folks. I'm going to go ahead and make this round. And we're going to do some practice cuts, okay? Okay, so what we're going to start off with here is a roughing gouge. This is a Robert Sorby uh, three-quarter inch roughing gouge. I dare say it's the one I use the most. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and make this thing round real quick. We've got it between centers. If I look on the uh, gauge, and really on the one way you just have a dial, you don't really have a gauge. It says that I should be somewhere around 12 or 1300 RPMs. Now, if you'll notice, I have that roughing gouge at a little bit of an angle. A lot of folks will tell you come in, get your uh, bevel raise it up and have it flat across there and honestly that's probably the best way to do it but one of the things that i have learned to do over the years is just kind of put it at an angle i can take a bigger cut i can get a smoother cut We had some bark come off of there, folks. Let's double check that. Let's keep going. Okay, let's take a look at this, folks. Got a, this wood is eat up with insects. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our three-quarter inch skew here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to practice some end cuts. And basically, that's going to make sure that we can square off the end of a piece of wood. It's always a good thing to practice a peeling cut. 
because that's going to be how we make our tenon. And we can come in and do an end cut to square that off. We're going to raise our tool rest up just a little bit. And let's see if we can do a planing cut. With that, we want to float that bevel across that wood. And folks, I want to give you guys a look. See the little curled shavings coming off of that? Super fine little shavings, not dust. And on this wood to not get dust is uh, saying something. I want you to look at how smooth that wood is. You know, that's, that's way smoother than you're going to get with a 100 grit sandpaper. So let's try this. There's a lot of things I do rounding something off. So let's just kind of make us a... Uh, let's make us a little ball here on the end. or bead I should say and basically all we're doing is we're coming in, we're cutting we're lifting and rotating that skew at the same time when I say lifting, we're lifting the back of the handle as we rotate it now we're going to switch over and we're going to hold it in our left hand and we're going to do the same thing with the left hand again as we start our cut, we're on our bevel, come down, get our cut, we're push, pushing with the left hand, raising it and rotating at the same time. Gives us a nice little bead, or nice large bead there I should say. Come in and do a nice clean up V cut here. This is just going to be one side of the V. And see that's why we practice. It didn't hurt anything here. Remember I haven't had a skew in my hand for weeks. And I did not practice before I started this video. So let's see if we got that uh, run back out of there. No, it went pretty deep. We didn't get it out. Let's go ahead and cut that on down and get it out of there. Left-handed. And coming back to the right hand. This is why we practice, folks. You want to get all that out of your system before you get on a nice piece of wood. And we'll take this opportunity to do one more peeling cut. We're going to get up here on our bevel. Come down till we start to cut. Push in and raise the handle. Now let's see what we can do with this little spindle gouge. Let's start by just rounding this over. And again, it involves working from the rear of the handle, raising and rotating as you come around.
That looked, worked pretty good. Let's see what we can do with a bowl gouge. Let's see here. We've done a couple of beads. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, let's take a look at that, folks. If we can find the smooth piece of wood, I want you guys to look at it. See how smooth that is? That's the skew. See how smooth that is? That's our spindle gouge. And even this, super smooth with a bowl gouge. Why? Because we were cutting, we were slicing that wood with each one of those cuts. I'm gonna make a V cut right here in this. The only reason I'm making a V cut is because I want you guys to see the difference in something. We're gonna take on this piece right here, we're gonna use the spindle roughing gouge and we're just gonna stick it straight into the wood. Theoretically, that's cutting, right? Here, we're going to run it at an angle. I made a couple of cuts both places there so you could guys could get a real good look at that. You can see the torn grain right over here where I went in at an angle. Remember, I went in straight here like so. You see all the torn grain right in here? I hope y'all can see that on camera. Let me give you a little closer look. Especially right in here, you see the torn grain? Here's a real good example of it right here. See the torn grain and right across? It's smooth. Here I went at an angle. Here I went straight in. So folks, the lesson here is if you're slicing that wood, you're going to get a really smooth cut. If you're lifting that wood, you're forcing it off of there, you're going to get a real rough, ragged cut. So what's the difference and why does it matter? For those of you that love sanding, it doesn't matter. For those of you that don't love sanding, if you do a slicing cut, you're going to be able to start off at a much higher grit and do much less sanding. It's up to you. So my suggestion to most of you would be learn how to do those slicing cuts. It'll make the job a whole lot easier for you and a whole lot more fun. Folks, again, my apologies for the lack of videos lately. If you like what you're seeing, please go down, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, share the video. That does more to get the, the name out, get the channel out, get more people viewing it than anything else. And I much appreciate everyone that's been doing that. Folks, thank you for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, and happy turning.